Even though the planets we call nearby might meet some conditions for being habitable, before anything else, we need to find a way to actually get there. Even though we say it's the closest, Proxima Centauri is ultimately another star. For us to be able to live there, we'd first need to figure out, literally, interstellar travel, meaning travel between stars. So, how possible is this with today's technology? Or could we reach Proxima Centauri, four light years away, with our near-future technologies, even if not today? When it comes to planets outside the solar system, meaning exoplanets, you've probably noticed something strange about how astronomers talk about their distances. Even when we talk about exoplanets tens of light years away, we often say they are very close. For example, when talking about Proxima Centauri, we often don't just say four light years, but emphasize it like only four light years. Because when you think about the distances to other stars and galaxies and the vastness of space, this distance really is right on our doorstep, practically a next door neighbor. Since we're used to concepts like meters and kilometers for travel in our daily lives, let's first take a look at how many kilometers 4.2 light years actually is. Given that one light year is about 9.46 trillion kilometers, 4.2 light years corresponds to roughly 40 trillion kilometers. That means we need to put a full 12 zeros after the number 40. To better grasp how huge this distance is for us, consider this. Even if we could travel at the speed of light, reaching Proxima Centauri four light years away would take us close to four years at best. But we're overlooking an important point here. Thanks to Einstein's theory of relativity, we know that at speeds close to the speed of light, time starts to flow slower compared to someone on Earth. For instance, imagine you set off on a journey towards Proxima Centauri, four light years away, at an incredible speed, like 99% of the speed of light. For you inside the spacecraft, this journey would only take about six months due to a phenomenon caused by relativity called time dilation. However, during that time, four years would have already passed back on Earth, the one you left behind. If we also factor in the return trip, while you spend a total of one year for the round trip, eight years would have passed on Earth. So in situations where we can travel near the speed of light, interstellar, or even intergalactic, travel isn't actually impossible from a time perspective. But let's be a bit more realistic about it. Saying 99% of the speed of light is easy, but forget traveling near light speed. Even reaching 1% of the speed of light seems like a utopian dream with our current technology, and saying 1% might not sound like a very high speed. However, if we remember that the speed of light is roughly 1 billion kilometers per hour, 1% of that means 10 million kilometers per hour. Yes, even 1% of the speed of light is nearly 10,000 times faster than a passenger airplane. So, if we hopped on a passenger plane and headed for Proxima Centauri, the journey would take 5 million years. Moreover, at these speeds, it's not possible for that time dilation effect to create a noticeable difference between an observer on Earth and the pilot inside the spacecraft. All right then, let's take a look at the fastest human-made vehicles. The fastest aircraft, NASA's X-43A, can reach speeds of 11,000 kilometers per hour. That's a truly enormous speed, but it still only corresponds to 0.001% of the speed of light. The fastest human-made object we can point to is the Parker Solar Probe launched from Earth in 2018, which used the Sun's gravity to reach a speed of 535,000 kilometers per hour. That's an incredible speed, but even that is still only equivalent to 0.05% of the speed of light. Even at the speed of the Parker Solar Probe, getting to Proxima Centauri would take us 7,230 years. Long story short, reaching even 1% of the speed of light is a huge problem. Let's remember that this isn't just about our technology being insufficient. We're talking about a kind of limit imposed on us by the laws of the universe. Because we always need energy to accelerate an object, but as speed increases, this energy requirement has to increase exponentially especially when our goal is to reach very high speeds, like 1% of the speed of light, supplying the energy needed for these speeds with today's rocket technology becomes impossible. Moreover, don't forget that the exoplanet we're using as a reference in all these calculations is orbiting Proxima Centauri, the closest star to us, meaning we've made all these calculations overly optimistically. 
The farthest exoplanet we've discovered so far is about 20,000 light years away. When reaching even an exoplanet 4 light years away seems impossible. Thinking about traveling to exoplanets tens, hundreds, or thousands of light years away is unfortunately just fantasy. So then, why do space agencies spend millions of dollars sending exoplanet hunting telescopes like Kepler or TESS to discover these exoplanets? Why do we get so excited when astronomers discover a potentially habitable exoplanet if we're never going to be able to go there? Scientific research isn't always done with the aim of getting direct, practical results. Think about it this way. When Galileo Galilei, considered the father of astronomy, pointed his telescope at Jupiter in 1610, he discovered four large moons orbiting it. Seeing that the moons changed position over time, meaning they orbited Jupiter, Galileo concluded that Earth was not the center of the universe. Just as these observed moons orbited Jupiter, the Earth orbited the Sun. Until then, the accepted model of the universe had Earth at its center. Imagine how the results of this observation by Galileo completely shattered people's perceptions and beliefs about their place in the universe. When Galileo was observing Jupiter or other planets, he didn't exactly know how to interpret these observations. He was simply curious. He was trying to figure out how the planets he saw in the sky fit into a system and what celestial dynamics governed the movement of the planet he stood on within that system. While searching for answers to these questions, he played a crucial role in developing the telescope, an indispensable tool for astronomical observations today, to see the planets whose nature he didn't fully understand more closely and in more detail. So while trying to answer the questions in his mind, there were also significant practical outcomes that would be used even centuries later. In a similar way, today we are curious about exoplanets, sending telescopes out and trying to find different types of planets. This gives us the chance to reassess the possibilities of whether we are alone in the universe we live in, each time with more concrete data. Indeed, despite all these observations, we still don't really have a clear idea of how common life is in the universe. Furthermore, we shouldn't ignore that the different techniques used while discovering exoplanets also lead to new tools and heaps of information that can be used in sciences like geology, biology, or chemistry. In short, just like in all other fields of research in science, we don't research exoplanets just for a direct output or benefit for us. We don't discover an exoplanet with the immediate intention of going and settling there. The dozens of exoplanets we've identified in the habitable zone emphasize the idea more strongly every day that we might not be alone in the universe. Just like the major consequences born from Galileo's observations with a small telescope about 400 years ago, our ideas about our place in the universe are reshaped with every new exoplanet discovered. For some, the fact that so many habitable exoplanets have been found even at very close distances to us indicates how ordinary and insignificant our position in the universe actually is. But for others, being on the only planet among all these exoplanets that we are still sure harbors life shows just how privileged we actually are. And of course, Although interpreting this isn't the job of science or astronomy, we need to discover and study more exoplanets to answer this question. Even if we're sure, we can never go there. But if you ask me, actually finding the answer one day to age-old questions like, are we alone in the universe, might even be more valuable than setting foot on a planet around one of those stars we see in the sky. See you in a completely different corner of the universe in the next video. Goodbye.